BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. If you're listening to some other podcasts, then um, stop now and listen to a good one because The Infinite Monkey Cage is back for a new series and we're doing loads of things, aren't we, Robin? We're going to be dealing with the science of laughter, conspiracy theories, coral reefs, quantum worlds and finally UFOs. I love UFOs. It's also, by the way, the UFO one available to watch on iPlayer. In fact, all of the series that we've done are available on BBC Sounds. I must say that I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with the first series. I don't think it's very good. I wouldn't bother with the first two. Yeah. But we were played by different people then, I think, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. Melvin Bragg was you. and um, You were Debbie McGee. Debbie McGee. Yeah. Bragg and McGee. Now that is a 1980s TV detective series that I will be making. Hi, I'm Rihanna Dillon, and you're listening to another seriously great podcast from BBC Radio 4. The knitting community is reckoning with racism. This precipitating incident has knitters taking a hard look at inclusion and representation. On Instagram, I started noticing that there was a lot of buzz about racism and diversity within the knitting community. I will preserve the blood-stained (laughs) racism-soaked knitting needles for future generations. This is the story of the purity spiral, of how a virus in the code A culture of moral outbidding, unchecked, can become an unstoppable force. A purity spiral occurs when a community becomes fixated on implementing a single value that has no upper limit and no single agreed interpretation. The result is a kind of moral feeding frenzy. In its extremes, a purity spiral is how we tumble towards the Crucible, or Mao's Red Guard, or Stalin's show trials. Yet... As you're about to hear, they're just as present in the world of online knitting or in young adult fiction. The basic dynamics are eternal features of our psyche. First morality binds, then morality blinds. I do think of Animal Farm, even if things started out with good intentions, it really becomes more of a power grab and rule through fear and complete authoritarianism. In the next 30 minutes, I want to go inside the mechanics of just how a society comes unstuck by telling the stories of two vicious purity spirals, both of which arose in the most innocuous of places. It doesn't take revolution, famine or witchcraft. The same sequence can play out just as well in jolly middle-class hobby spaces. If the focus of their attention comes upon you, unless you abase yourself and grovel publicly saying, thank you for telling me how dreadful a human being I have been, you're next. My descent into the darkest coves of our collective unconscious begins with a man called Sockmetician. Hello. Hiya, Gavin from the BBC. Hello, come on in. Thank you. My name is Nathan Taylor and I am known on the web as Sockmetician. I mean, you are quite famous in knitting circles, would it be fair to say? Yes, definitely. I've only been knitting for about eight years as an adult. I learned as a child. Um, in fact, that's that dark green pink panther down there is the first thing I ever knit. But I have a, a very, well, did have a very successful YouTube video podcast and uh, a large following both there and on Instagram. Tell me about diverse knitty. I coined the term early July 2018. I was scrolling through my Instagram feed and there was a, a photograph of a woman with a very, very beautiful smile. She was one of those radiant people that you just know when she walks into a room, she brings sunshine with her. But it wasn't her smile that caught my eye. It was the fact that she was black. And I thought, oh, I think I might be part of the problem. There's been a very, very real discussion and a real need to address the underrepresentation of non-white knitters in the community. And I realised that because my feed is full of the people that I follow, and I saw so few black faces on there that I clearly was only following the majority of white knitters. And I thought something's got to change here. So Nathan smashed together two words, diversity and knitting, and came up with a hashtag, Diversity. I put out this post saying, if you are a non-white knitter and you follow me and I don't follow you back, please wave at me, please say hello, let's start a a relationship. The knitting world did wave back. Diversity inspired 17,000 posts on Instagram. It was a runaway hit. Nathan encouraged other knitters to use their diversity posts to open up about their personal experiences, to, as he put it, share what you dare. 
gifts. I put a, a whole list of things about me. I said, I, I'm gay. My name is Nathan. I have green eyes. I used to keep pet rats. I got married on national television. I have HIV. I sing all the time. I sometimes annoy people. I don't care. Um, all of these things, that none of which individually define me as a person, but all of which together paint a, a broad picture. And I encourage people to do the same. The hashtag didn't invent the diversity conversation, but it did catalyse it. Increasingly, knitwear models now also came in darker tones. Increasingly, knitting festivals began putting together panel discussions on race. Online, the voices of what the knitting world now knew as BIPOC, black and indigenous persons of colour, became central, telling the rest what life had been like for them. I just noticed that the space was easy to navigate when I didn't show who I was, because then you couldn't assume that I was a black person. Knitting spaces are unsafe for BIPOC and probably others. Only, in the eyes of those who spoke of diversity in knitting in that order, it seemed the more that knitting changed, the more things were uncovered that still needed to change. A granularity crept in. Instead of criticising tendencies, individuals began to find themselves in the crosshairs of the movement. White supremacy has a face, and it's your face. By January 2019, talk of white supremacy and racial privilege had saturated the knitting world. What happened next was not something very important. In fact, it was the opposite. Something very trivial happened. A tiny spark that landed on bone-dry tinder. Knitter Catherine Jebson Moore was one of the first writers to pick up on knitting's racial tensions. Karen Templer wrote a post on her blog where she described going to India and she likened the experience to going to Mars and she received quite a lot of criticism for that. Instead of asking your Indian friends to perform an emotional labour you and assuage your white woman tears, maybe do some reflection on your own. Your equation of India with an alien world reinforces an other mindset that is at the core of imperialism and colonialism. Hundreds of comments later, Karen Templer published a lengthy and fulsome apology. I spent the week listening hard and thinking about all of the things I can do to be more inclusive and supportive of people of colour. Meanwhile, 3,000 miles away in Seattle... Hey guys, welcome to Tuscan Knits. A wool dyer called Maria Tuscan found herself disquieted by what had happened. I put up a YouTube video because I have a, a YouTube channel where I talk about my knitting and I mentioned this issue and how I disagreed with it. There was a very intense social justice issue that started infiltrating Instagram a few weeks ago. I would say it was very hostile. And, and I didn't think it was really about this social justice issue that everyone said it was about. I believed it was just sort of a bunch of people wanting to get power and take people down and destroy businesses like mine. You can be destroyed in less than 24 hours. This may not even be relevant in the future if you're watching this, so I'll put a timestamp. After that video, the mob just went after me and... I got thousands of messages in email and on my video. You're a white woman living in the countryside with a successful business. You're the definition of privileged. Ain't nobody going to take your side. And if they do, they're just as racist. You greasy-faced Nazi sympathizer. Watching matters unfold, Nathan Taylor had become increasingly alarmed by what he'd seen. Diversity was now heading towards calamity. So now, he resolved to make a second grand intervention. He would step in and put a halt to the denunciations in the only way he knew how. Poetry. He tapped some verse into Instagram. With genuine solemnity, I beg you stop the enmity. Don't use the word diversity to mask your animosity. Your bullying ferocity and insta-anonymity and self-imposed impunity is breaking our community. Instead, use positivity and mutual unanimity. He duly received plenty of feedback. How did you become the next target of their attentions? Oh, golly. Um, the most vicious cyberbullying trolling attack I've ever witnessed or encountered. Uh, it completely blindsided me. They took it to mean that I was telling the black community to be nice. 
I wasn't. I was telling the knitting community to be respectful. But that was me telling the black community to be nice. And apparently, telling the black community to be nice is telling them to be white, and that is white supremacy. So I became a white supremacist, a racist, a Nazi apologizer, who happens to be married to a Jewish man. And this is the kind of stuff that, unless you've been through it, it's impossible to know what that feels like to have hundreds, possibly thousands of people all around the world believing that you are an evil person. Nathan Taylor upholds white supremacy and propagates violence against white women. It seems like maybe he was always part of the white male patriarchy and has been exploiting the power gained from being part of that group for a long time. Hundreds of posts later, with the vitriol still flowing, Nathan's mind cracked and imploded. He was rushed to hospital by his husband after threatening to drive his car at 100 miles an hour into a brick wall. I left Nathan's house dazed by the ferocity of the spiral. In exactly a year, he'd gone from diversity pioneer to abject prey as the knitters weaponized the concept of race sensitivity against each other. The fate of Robespierre came to mind. More chilling still was that once it got going, the process seemed unstoppable. All objections were merely read as further evidence of guilt and punished accordingly. This is the modern hobby, the destruction of strangers for Puritan reasons. Douglas Murray is the author of The Madness of Crowds. That's right. Beating people into submission to agree to a certain set of principles is, is all going on for no discernible good and to nobody's apparent benefit. There is no area of life that this thing cannot rampage through. And so perhaps it was inevitable that at some point the monster would come and rip up the world of knitting. But where would that rampage end? By now it seemed that only those who'd begun the process still had power enough to finish it. The knitters who had tightened the gyre week upon week. It was to them I now turned. <laughs> Or did I? Because a funny thing happened next. I contacted more than 20 of the proudest, loudest, most engaged knitting activists. None wished to explain their views, though many still found the time to block me. One even responded with a cease and desist letter. Overnight, a wall of silence ascended like few I've seen in journalism. Off the record, insiders told me that this was exactly what I should expect that the knitter's endless talk of white supremacy and white fragility was, in fact, jargon, embedded in a once obscure academic worldview that came out of US universities in the late 80s, a lens called critical race theory, which says that race is socially constructed and a means to maintain the interests of the white population. I went to talk to a man who had the Rosetta Stone to this private language, Kehinde Andrews, professor of black studies at Birmingham City University and long-time critical race theorist. I mean, it's totally naive to think that there's not going to be racism in online knitting. I mean, look, racism structures social life. So anywhere you go and anywhere you look, you will find online racism, be knitting, whether it be universities, uh, whether it be in the government. And I think that's the thing you're finding in the knitting communities is it is a space which is almost exclusively white, right? And that's that's the problem. And there's too far too many spaces which are almost exclusively white. And when black and minority people are in those spaces, they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel they're treated fairly, effectively. So now we come to someone who is a minority in knitting. He's a man, Nathan Taylor. He's also a gay man living with HIV who started a hashtag called Diversity. So when people were calling him a white supremacist, was that a proportionate response? I guess it depends what your definition of what a white supremacist is, right? We live in a white supremacist society. That's just the truth. People certainly on social media take things too far. Sometimes the consequences don't necessarily meet what the crime is and as black people we experience that far more than other people one of the major problems with whiteness is that it's everywhere but then when you start to poke at it very 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 fragile so what you have is people get very upset about it people don't want to talk about it people shut it down so that's kind of the idea of white fragilities and that's one of the reasons you can't have a proper conversation about race people just don't like the accusation don't like the discussion feel very very uncomfortable about it in that context nathan's poem was supremacist fragility at its finest Racism kind of plays out lots of times with through the paper cuts. Like it's not big overt stuff, it's the little everyday embarrassment. So this idea that you can like you tell someone to be nice or to calm down, it's to basically telling you it's not that serious, it's not that important. And this is one thing that will always get 
any minority mad because we're raising issues, which maybe you don't understand why it's so important, but it really is, right? These are quite harmful things. What if you're not racist and you've been accused of racism? That seems like quite a sort of a triggering event in one's life. The idea that you'll go through life without doing something which reinforces white supremacy is a fantasy. It's going to happen because how important white supremacy is to shaping social life. It seemed to me that Professor Andrews had expressed precisely the logic that made critical race theory so combustible a fuel for purity spirals. A moral landscape in which everyone is born to original sin, but some are more guilty than others. Of course, it could all have been the work of a few bad eggs, as Andrews had also suggested, the basic combativeness of online culture. But if you were looking for a realm of bitter, exhaustive moral combat, that was also even less macho than knitting. Well, you could only try young adult fiction. It could be funny to think that in this community where we talk about, oh, my character is going to kiss this boy and it's going to be great, or, oh, this character is going to, like, hunt down trolls or go to space, that we're then having these really hard-hitting and in-depth discussions about some extremely complex and nuanced ideas. Corinne Duvis is a Dutch author of sci-fi and fantasy young adult fiction. Just as Nathan Taylor did with Diversity, Corrine created her own hashtag. It's called uh, Own Voices. Own Voices means a work of fiction about a character from a marginalised group written by an author who also identifies as being from that marginalised group. For example, my second novel is Own Voices because it's an autistic character written by an autistic author. It can be related to queerness, to race, to disability to gender identity, anything. If this is purely books by people who are just imagining what something must be like rather than speaking from experience, you'll end up with a very skewed image. The diversity debate started in a well-intentioned place. Journalist and young adult author Kat Rosenfield. You have, about 10 years ago, people beginning to realize that young adult fiction was being written by overwhelmingly white women and being written about white female protagonists, and also that the people who were working in publishing houses overwhelmingly were from white upper-middle-class backgrounds. And so there was this conversation that began to take place saying, this is not great, this isn't reflective of American society at large, and it needs to change. Laura Moriarty is a professor of creative writing at the University of Kansas. In 2017, she wrote about challenging stereotypes. Or so she thought. My fifth novel, American Heart, is a YA book that imagines a United States where American Muslims are deported to safety zones in Nevada. The narrating character is a young non-Muslim who believes that deportations are necessary and a good idea until she meets an American Muslim headed to freedom, who's the first actual Muslim she's ever met. Almost a year before the book was released, I was sitting in my office on campus and someone I don't know sent me an email saying, you should check out the conversations going on on YA Twitter about your problematic white savior book. Actually, if you read the book, you'll see that the main character realizes accurately that she alone can't save anyone. But you have to read the book to know that. And at this point, no one could have read the book. On the influential website Goodreads, a milky way of one-star user reviews now rained down on Moriarty's as-yet-unpublished book. F*** your white savior narratives. F*** using marginalised characters as a plot device to teach the white middle class how to be a decent person. F*** this book and everyone who thought it would be a good f***ing idea. To my Muslim friends, I'm sorry this book and this mind exists. So disgusted and mad, I can't even... I mean, did you read the blurb? No, 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 stop it. Young adult publishers were already well aware of the febrile atmosphere. To adapt to the new mood, they had increasingly been using the services of so-called sensitivity readers. These were editors, usually from minority groups, who are paid to give feedback on what aspects of a book might be problematic. The book is based on Huck Finn, so at the beginning of the book, Sarah Mary, the main character, who has never known a Muslim person, is full of ignorance. But I think it's meant for young readers, and any young reader could suss out that 
she's speaking out of ignorance. She contradicts herself. Things in the book quickly contradict her whenever she says something um, negative about a Muslim person. But the sensitivity readers would circle every time that happened and write, you know, untrue. Kirkus is sometimes described as the Michelin Guide of American literature. Around this time, they had lavished one of their prestigious starred reviews on the book. It called American Heart a moving portrait of an American girl discovering her society in crisis, sensible, thought-provoking, and touching, and they give it a star, which is an honor Kirkus reserves for only 10% of the books it reviews. Then a really crazy thing happened. The people attacking the book on Twitter, they started protesting Kirkus's starred review, and they called it a sign of Kirkus's support for white supremacy. That actually isn't the crazy thing. That's the expected thing. And again, you know, people have the right to protest whatever they want. But the crazy thing was that three days later, Kirkus released a statement explaining that the reviewer who'd loved American Heart and who gave it a starred review was an own voices reviewer. She was a practicing Muslim and a woman of color, and she had loved the book. But nonetheless, they were going to have her reevaluate her thoughts on the book. It's ironic that the opinion that was censored in the name of diversity belongs to a Muslim woman of color. And I just want to point out that the editor-in-chief of Kirkus at the time who made the decision to make the reviewer alter review is a white man who is not Muslim. And most of the protesters were white and most of the protesters were not Muslim either. If you start to follow this, you see the same names writing the takedowns over and over. They're not looking for anything but to destroy books that don't fit their purity tests and to show their own purity and moral uprightness. Even some of the people doing it were maybe acting out of fear because if they don't do it, um, they get looked at next, you know? As bizarre as it may have seemed, as the ethical ratchet continued to tighten around young adult fiction, Laura Moriarty's case became pretty bog standard. Laurie Forrest's fantasy novel, The Black Witch, was removed from publication after a 9,000-word blog by an unknown amateur reviewer tore into it as The most dangerous, offensive book I have ever read. Last year, Chinese-American author Amelie Zhao withdrew her book, Blood Air, after a controversy over its depiction of slavery. She later explained that the story was based on Chinese people trafficking, not, as had been assumed, on the Confederate South. One of Xiao's key critics was a black, gay, American part-time sensitivity reader, Kosoko Jackson. Jackson's own debut novel was a romance between two teenage boys set during the Kosovo War. Or it would have been, had it not in turn been cancelled for allegedly minimising the suffering of Albanian Muslims. Knitting, young adult fiction, these are genteel, small business-oriented spaces which lends their descent into a war of all against all, a comic flair true. But the shape of these societies is also what has made them uniquely vulnerable to a purity spiral. Each is a space where a tapestry of micro-empires flourish, where the line between personal brand and professional brand is deliberately blurred, and so where gossip is solid currency. Most are thus small enough to be uniquely vulnerable to excommunication. It's a world where fear imposes its own censorship, and so the writ of a single dominant group can hold. But most businesses are also small enough to cash in from the celebrity of becoming a moral pole in the community. In other words, denunciation sells. For Corrine Duvis, the tragedy is that the policing of small differences actively deflects from the tackling of the big differences. I have seen enough discussions go into a direction that I don't personally agree with. But I really hate that as a result of that, a lot of people just discredit the discussion as a whole. It's important as authors and people in general to look at, hey, what responsibility do we have? And particularly if you are someone from a privileged group, to realize what impact your actions may have on others. Because even if you're not intentionally doing something, there might still be consequences for other people. And a lot of the time, honestly, it's going to be important to just step aside and pass the microphone to someone else. Almost any purity spiral begins with a noble motive, a good cause to rally the people round. And as Kareen points out, there are plenty of solid reasons to shout about identity issues. 
Yet the critical race theory worldview is so absolutist, so totalizing in its definitions of racial offence and so driven by individual subjective experience that it seems to hand the keys to precisely whoever can shout the loudest. As a theory, it has no exit doors. Which is why I wanted to ask Kehinde Andrews, how do I know when I'm looking at someone weaponizing victimhood, i.e. a purity spiral, and how do I know when I'm just looking at the justified correction of an online mob? Um, yeah, no, two things can look similar. But if you're provoking that kind of reaction, it's worth reflecting on why you're provoking that kind of reaction. And is it because you've, you've hit a nerve of racism or is it because actually you did something that was a little bit sketchy? We do generally need to have this, a different conversation about what the terms like white supremacy really mean. What does racism really mean? As an individual, you're more than likely going to do things and have attitudes and say things which are going to reinforce racism. Uh, the question is, where do those come from? How do we tackle that? How do we get to the bigger cause? And there is something about these purity spirals also that it does make people feel morally superior, right? I'm not a racist because I'm jumping on this person who is a racist. And again, this is the worst way to think about this conversation. Where does it all end? When does any purity spiral collapse under its own centrifugal force? Back in the world of online knitting, by the autumn of 2019, things had gone from bad to very bad. But then, at the very end of September, something twitched. Diversity's Nathan Taylor published a 90-minute vlog, finally setting out his side, entitled simply, The Truth. Every night, I go to bed. And when I've had stomach churning days where I can't stop replaying and replaying, she said this and she said this and that, and this and they did this to me. I take great comfort in the knowledge that the difference between me and all the people who have decided that this is an acceptable way to behave, the difference between me and them is that I have always chosen to make a difference by building people up. In the weeks that followed, a few Instagram posts appeared alongside a new hashtag. Dismantle the knitting cult. Sometimes this type of bullying works because it's easier to do what they want than be the next target. Courage is contagious. We can all speak our truth and hopefully learn from each other, but no one ever learned anything through shaming. And after sharing his story, Nathan received well over a thousand messages of support. He experienced a huge spike in pattern sales. So much so that in two weeks, he recovered all that he'd lost in cancelled work. Purity spirals are welded to the deepest parts of human psychology. They've come at us throughout history. The very worst represent the pinnacle nightmares of civilization. The problem, from the Khmer Rouge down, is that purity can look so much like morality, and we only see the spiral in the aftermath. These spirals are reinforced by self-censorship and undergirded by the dynamics of tipping points. But then, tipping points also work in both directions. It just takes a Spartacus or three. And though we can't always stop them, recognising the signs is always a good start. The more you say its name, the more it flinches. After all, what's the best inoculation against witch finders? A population that doesn't believe in witches. That was another seriously interesting story brought to you by BBC Radio 4. And join me, Rihanna Dillon, for another seriously interesting story next time.